Hi and welcome to this webinar on how to perform simulations in Elsdyna using discrete element spheres. My name is David and I work at Dynamo Nordic. In this presentation I will talk about why we need discrete element spheres, how it works, how you create models, how you look at the results, and I will also present a small performance benchmark. In the end, I will also give a summary of the relevant keywords and features. So the motivation of discrete element spheres is that when you have a granular material, it is not easy to describe it as a fluid or a solid. So this is just some examples of granular materials and numerical simulations of these materials could help in the design of storage, transportation, processing and filling. My focus today will be on gravel and as you see here there are many things that you could do with simulations of gravel. You could study bulk flow, you could study loads on the media and uh, the structure or you could for instance study wear. But we start with describing how simulations with discrete element spheres work. The spherical particles, they have a mass, radius and six degrees of freedom, which means that they can translate and rotate. The particles follow Newton's laws of motion and they interact through contact. Of course, in these simulations, we need an explicit time integration scheme. The input required for each element is very simple. You have the node, which tells us where the particle is. Then each particle is assigned a part ID, a mass, an inertia and a radius. However, it is much more common to use the volume option on element discrete sphere. Then density is set to unity in the generation of the particles and then the properties can be scaled later using the material card. The easiest way to generate particles is to use LS prepost. What you need is a closed shell volume. Like that. And then you generate discrete element spheres on this button. And you start by clicking on the volume and then you select the radius interval for the uh, discrete element to be generated and you click create and here you can see a preview of the generated particles and when you hit accept you accept the generated particles it should be noted that the thickness of the shell element element is not accounted for in the generation so if you need to account for that, you need to offset the shell elements before generating the particles. As always with an Elsdyna simulation, you need to specify a section card and a material card for the part that contains the discrete element spheres. The values on the section card, however, are ignored, whereas the values on the material card are used to calculate the context stiffnesses and the time step size and also the mass when you use the volume option on discrete element sphere. In order to get the correct bulk behavior that you're looking for, you need to perform some calibrations, for instance, by inverse modeling of bulk experiments. Now I have seen a couple of different versions of bulk experiments, and here are a few of them. Uh, it could be tests of flow, you could measure the pile underneath the funnel to get the angle of repose, you can have a compression test, a drum mixer test, or maybe even a pullout test. But this is just a few examples of what can be done in order to calibrate your parameters. So the parameters I'm talking about are the parameters that are active in the sphere-to-sphere -sphere interaction. And these are found on under control discrete element. And you can categorize these parameters into friction parameters, contact damping and stiffness parameters, and also parameters that are dealing with the capillary forces. 
A couple of years ago we came across a dissertation containing experimental results from a shear box test. So we decided to try to use these experimental results to calibrate friction parameters for rocks. As you can see there is a pressure applied on the top of the volume containing the rocks and then the upper half of the box is displaced so that uh, shear is created in the bulk volume. We also found a master thesis on the subject with similar test data, so we included that as well. What we found out was that the sliding friction in the sphere-to-sphere -sphere interaction was the most important factor in changing the force level of the shearing of the box. We tried using real stone geometries documented in the dissertation as well. But as you can see here, the contact situation is quite complicated and uh, it was difficult simulations to perform. But the results were quite similar to what we saw with the spherical elements. A little bit more surprising was that the rolling friction between the spherical particles didn't seem to affect the results that much. And this for us didn't seem very reasonable, so we came up with an idea to test with a dynamic load case as well to see what happens then when the particles are accelerated in rotation. Again we tried to compare with the documented stone geometries but this simulation was even harder uh, than the static one. You see that the contact is boiling, we have been too aggressive with the time step size. Nevertheless we tried to compare not having any rolling friction at, at all and having a certain amount of rolling friction you can see a very large difference so it does play an important role but maybe this wasn't an excellent way to calibrate the rolling friction parameter the rolling friction is a way to compensate for the fact that real particles are not completely spherical in the same way we need to have a special contact between the spherical particles and the surface. In a classical contact, for instance the node to surface contact, the friction force acts in through the center of the particle. But with the new defined DE to surface coupling, the friction force is instead applied at the perimeter. So you set both a friction coefficient and a rolling friction coefficient. This contact also includes the possibility to define transportation belts and also do wear calculations. Finally, before showing some simulation results, I would like to mention the keyword define DE active region. That is an important keyword to increase the computational efficiency as particles are deactivated as they leave the defined volume. Now here is a small simulation model I have made as an example. It's an excavation bucket lifting stones. And there are a couple of things you could note with this simulation. The first thing is that uh, you can see that the stones are a bit compressed in the beginning of the simulation. And that is because uh, the packing algorithm hasn't packed the stones completely. And that is yeah, more or less an impossible task to pack stones completely. So when I switch on gravity in the beginning of the simulation, you can see that these stones are packed a bit closer together. Also, you can see when I lift the excavation bucket that some stones are balancing on top of each other. And this is due to the rolling friction, which compensates for the non-sphericalness of the stones. And the final thing you can see is that when the stones are coming over the edge of the box, they are disappearing from the simulation and that is the define active region keyword that is acting. It is also possible to calculate where as I said before and you can post process this through uh, uh, using the keyword database binary dem for. And for those of you familiar with database binary int for this works in the same way.
In LS Prepost, it's also possible to view the discrete element spheres as points. And this is not as demanding. Uh, so when you have large models with a large number of discrete element spheres, the rendering goes more quickly if you view them as points and it's quicker to rotate your model and work with it. To look at the efficiency of LS Dyna when it comes to uh, simulations with discrete element spheres, uh, I found a small benchmark model online which I compared simulation times with uh, another leading software in discrete element spheres. And um, as we see, LS Dyna is comparatively as quick as the other code. And it's very difficult to say because they are not set up identically. Uh, parameters are set a bit differently, but it seems like uh, LS Dyna is keeping up at least. And uh, from what I've heard, there are still some improvements that will be made in the future. So I think this looks okay. Now we have come to the final subject for this webinar. I have listed some of the most common keywords that are used when in doing simulations with discrete elements spheres. You have seen most of them already. Boundary DE non-reflecting is a keyword you haven't seen, but it's for creating a non-reflecting boundary. Uh, these keywords you have also seen, but there are a couple of more ways to couple discrete element spheres to beams or tie them to surfaces. You can also measure mass flows in your simulations. And there are some other keywords which are probably more rarely used. So thank you for tuning in. If you want to see more videos, please look at our YouTube channel or our website.